Dear students, I welcome you all to this lecture on the agrarian question in South Asia. The main aim of this lecture is to explain agrarian transition in South Asian countries. According to Terry Byers, the agrarian question may be defined as the continuing existence in the countryside of a poor country of substantive obstacles to an unleashing of the forces capable of generating economic development, both inside and outside agriculture. The nature of agrarian change is an important determinant of social transformation. The history of agrarian development in South Asia is characterized by the persistence of mass poverty and increasing inequality in the rural areas. The failure of industrialization to create jobs and the presence of an agriculture sector dominated by smallholders requires that we reconsider the nature of agrarian transition. The lecture addresses two areas that are central to agrarian question in South Asia. First, the character of land reforms and second, the nature of structural transformation of the economy. The lecture focus is on the biggest country of the region, which is India. A majority of population in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka remain engaged in agriculture even as the contribution of agriculture to gross domestic product falls. Agriculture in South Asia has remained a low productivity and low income activity. About 57 percent of South Asia's land mass is devoted to farming, while nearly 60 percent of its population is engaged in agricultural production. Much of this activity is undertaken by vulnerable smallholders, while women also play a significant role. According to Food and Agriculture Organization data, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bhutan, more than 60 percent of women work in agricultural sector. The agriculture productivity of the region is in decline and with the increasing population, natural resource degradation and high rates of poverty means that the region is already contending with food insecurity. Dear students, now I will be talking about what constitutes feudal mode of production. According to Henry Burstein, feudal mode of production or feudalism is a mode of production in which classes of feudal landed property appropriate surplus produce from peasant producers in the form of rent. In feudalism, the landlord classes interested in agriculture and other sectors only to the extent to which it could exploit peasants of their produce for its own benefit and laws were enacted to enable this. The ultimate result of this type of economic structure was the backwardness of the productive forces of the economy. As has been nicely stated by Akram Lodi and Kristobal K, in feudalism, surplus extraction was the basis by which dominant landlord class reproduced itself. Surplus extractions from the peasantry were carried out through the mechanism of rent and backed up by force. Production was organized through the institution of serfdom to fit the needs of surplus extraction. Peasant ownership was by and large excluded and therefore pre-capitalist feudal relations cannot develop the forces of production because lords ultimately use force to appropriate the agriculture surplus from the peasantry and not having to rely upon the markets and the competitive imperatives that they generate. Lords can increase their incomes by making peasants work harder, work longer or reducing their incomes. But there is neither incentive nor the need to systematically improve the efficiency, labor productivity that market imperatives demand. Thus, in feudalism, the material benefit of heavy surplus extraction gave no incentive nor the need to systematically improve the efficiency. Feudalism was the main reason of low productivity of agricultural sectors of money developing countries. It is generally well acknowledged 
that the creation of a class of economically empowered small peasant producers through land reforms played a key role in the agricultural transformations in these countries. Dear students, now I will be discussing about land reforms and the industrialization debate. Land reforms are seen as correcting a historical wrong in the allocation of land ownership and use rights. White, Burroughs and Hall in their paper of 2013 have distinguished between two types of land reforms. One is conventional and the another broader. A conventional approach of land reforms is limited to redistribution of land from large private landlords to small peasant farmers and landless agriculture workers. This approach is just restricted to altering structures of access to land. A broader definition of land reforms not only includes redistribution of land, but also aims at promoting agrarian transition, whether to capitalist, modernized, smallholder or collective systems. It includes a more comprehensive and broader macroeconomic vision of enhancing farm productivity and farm sectors contribution through promotion of access of landholders to various inputs such as knowledge, credit and markets. Land reforms were not only seen as means by which land is redistributed and self-sufficiency in food grains production is attained, but also were intended to assist the processes of state-led industrialization. On the agrarian question, there is an important discussion between Henry Burstein and Terry Byers. They stressed that the development of productive forces in agriculture in transitions to capitalism is necessary for industrialization, what Byers terms as agrarian transition. And also, the state has to play a historical role as the prime mover of agrarian transformation. Byers argued that in order for agriculture to no longer pose any obstacles to capitalist transformation, the agrarian question must be resolved through some form of successful agrarian transition. Another major debate on development strategy that is close to agrarian question has been on land and agrarian reforms, agrarian transformation and industrialization. Cristobal K critiques Byers by arguing that he fails to explain how best to stimulate agriculture's development, thereby running the risk that agriculture growth might stall with negative consequences for the industry. Kay's synergy perspective on the relationship between agriculture and industry in the process of development stresses that the development strategy should focus on how to achieve and maximize intersectoral synergies as well as the state has to play a pivotal role in the process of surplus creation, extraction and transfer from agriculture to industry. Taking the development experience of East Asian countries and Latin American countries as comparative case studies, case states that in the case of Taiwan, the extraction of various surpluses from agriculture undoubtedly made a major contribution to the initial stage of industrial development as the provision of cheap rice kept industrial wages low, boosted industrial profits and enhanced industrial exports. Burstein argues that in the post-globalization period, the import of goods and services including food grain have become easier with mobile capital providing support to industry. These processes have meant that global capitalist development can proceed without resolving the agrarian question at the national level. According to Burstein, the state is either unwilling or unable to play this role capital is no longer constrained by national boundaries. National industrial development cannot be separated from the international capital and the global commodity chains. Land reform as a means of uniting landless or small peasants against the landlords is a strategy that has lost relevance as national capital no longer looks towards accumulation from below for its sustenance. Now I will be talking about land reforms in South Asia. 
land reforms came on the national agenda in a major way in the post world war second period. In most countries, national movements were built with strong support of the peasantry and thus redistribution of land became immediate priority. In Pakistan, the land reforms of 1959 and 1972 failed to alter significantly the highly unequal distribution of land ownership. Hussein states that as much as 30 percent of total farm area in Pakistan is owned by large land owners owning more than 150 acres and above. Yet these land owners constitute only 0.5 percent of the total number of land owners in the country. Nepal was largely under a feudal system where a small number of landlords held most of the agriculture land. The basic purpose of the land reforms was to protect the tenant farmer, take away excess holdings from landlords and distribute property to farmers with small land holding, holdings to 1 to 3 hectares and landless agrarian households. While there was some success in providing security to tenant farmers, not much has been achieved in redistribution. In India, Social mobilization of peasants for agrarian reform was also an integral part of the national liberation movement from the beginning. Francine Frankel's work on India's political economy concluded that in spite of introducing land reform legislation in the early 1950s, there was lack of agrarian redistribution as it was monopolized by the propertied classes who were able to capture the village institutions. Further, she argues that to achieve the goal of social transformation, a prior institutional change was necessary. The lack of progress in land reforms in India during the 1950s and 1960s was complicated by the fact that each state government had its own policies which were not always the same as those prescribed by the national legislation. In India, the efforts spread over a period of three and a half decades to enforce ceilings and to take away surplus land from landlords for redistribution among landless led to redistribution of less than 2 percent of the operated area. This is according to the paper by Sharma and Jha in 2016. Among the states, the area distributed as a percentage of total area operated was 17.4 percent in Jammu and Kashmir, 6.36 percent in West Bengal and 5 percent in Assam. In all other states, only less than 1 percent of the operated area could be distributed. However, according to Besley and Burgess in their paper, they have argued that land reforms in 16 major states of India have led to reduction in rural poverty. However, a study by Gattak and Roy shows that land reforms in India led to a decline in agriculture productivity. According to Dibarshi Das, massive subdivision and fragmentation of land holdings characterize contemporary South Asia. The petty nature of the agriculture production and state policies have together depressed agriculture prices and thus have perpetuated the condition of low capital accumulation in a petty peasant economy. Dear students, now I will be talking about structural transformation in South Asia. Development denotes a qualitative process of widespread structural transformation that necessitates the augmenting the productive forces of the economy. Economic development happens when there is a fundamental structural transformation in the productive structure of the economy and also the underlying capabilities that make that productive transformation possible. Structural change entails the movement of labor from low productivity sectors like agriculture into more modern sectors of the economy. Simon Kuznets includes structural transformation as one of the six stylized facts of economic development, finding that development countries all followed the same process. It necessitates 
the deliberate process of introducing new technologies, acquisition of new skills by workers, large scale manufacturing and an overall shift from lower productivity activities to higher productivity ones. The Prebish Singer thesis stresses that industrialization is the most promising process to free developing nations from their subordinate status in the global economy in the long run. According to Whitefield and Burr, economic development is fundamentally a process of structural transformation. It involves the reallocation of assets and resources from unproductivity, subsistence and low productivity economic activities into high productivity economic activities in agriculture, manufacturing and services. It involves diversifying into new areas of production, strengthening economic linkage and increasing domestic technological capabilities. The changes over time in the composition of output and the contributions of each sector to employment can assure the structural transformation of an economy. Economies that depend on primary sectors that is agriculture in their initial stages of development shift to a structure where industry and services sector dominate as their incomes rise. Historically, all countries that have achieved structural transformation have undergone two stages of changes. First, a movement of labor from agriculture to manufacturing and services and then a movement of labor from both agriculture and manufacturing to services. According to Srinivasan, for most South Asian countries, the share of services in GDP exceeds the share of manufacturing and agriculture sectors. Agriculture share in GDP has been declined in all countries as is to be expected in the course of countries' development. Industry's share in GDP has been stagnant in all the countries with the exception of Bangladesh and Bhutan. The rising share of services in GDP is remarkable, particularly in Nepal, India and Sri Lanka. The structural transformation experience in India has been different from international experience. The agriculture and allied sector services are known as primary sector. The manufacturing sector is known as the secondary sector. The service sector is known as the tertiary sector. Table 1 shows the sectoral composition of GDP in India for the decades 1950 to 2000. As can be seen from Table 1, the sectoral share of primary sector has decreased from 55.53% in 1950s to around 28.66% in 1990s. The share of secondary sector has not shown much improvement. It was around 16% in 1950s, which has increased to around 27% in 1990s. In terms of tertiary sector, there has been a change of around from 28.09% in 1950s to around 44% in 1990s. The sectoral share of employment in India is given in Table 2. As can be seen from Table 2, the share of primary sector in terms of workers employed decreases from just 69% to around 60.4% in 1999. The structural transformation of the Indian economy has remained stunted as so much labor has remained locked in agriculture. The usual trend of the decline in the share of agriculture sector in the GDP has not been accompanied by a matching fall in the workforce dependent on agriculture. While the sectoral share of agriculture in GDP decreased from 55.53% in 1950-60 to 28.66% in 1990s, the share in workforce decreased from 69% in 1983 to 60.4% in the decade of 1990s. As is clear, the fall in the share of agriculture in the GDP is much greater than the fall in its share in the workforce dependent on it. This only indicates low productivity of labor in the agriculture sector. 
This is mainly due to the reason that in India manufacturing contributes a very small share in the industry and the economy as a whole and has not shown significant growth over the years. The slow growth of manufacturing sector has led to slow absorption of labor. The Indian economy is found to have followed the classical patterns of transformation towards secondary and tertiary sectors in terms of contribution to overall output, but not so much in terms of employment. Biswangir and Mackenzie have argued that the structural transformation in India is a stunted one in which workers move from agriculture sector to the rural informal non-farm sector rather than to formal jobs in the non-agriculture sector. A backward social and economic system rooted in landlordism and caste has meant that development of agriculture in India has remained stunted. To sum up this lecture, the structural transformation has implications for the nature and magnitude of growth. Growth can be inclusive if structural transformation of the economy is conducive to productive employment generation and utilizing the underemployed labor force engaged in activities of low productivity. The absence of decisive agrarian transition in the development process has been a fundamental barrier to improving the conditions of its people. There is an urgent need to solve the agrarian question and for that redistribution of land becomes a prerequisite for economic growth and development. Dear students, that was all about today's lecture which I have discussed with you in relation to agrarian question in South Asia. Hope you have understood it well. Thanks for watching it.